Kat Simmons and Kat Nelson Dooley. Welcome to the Root Cause Medicine Podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Great to be here. Oh, I'm excited to have you here. We have some really cool education coming up together in a few weeks. You guys are going to be launching a six-week course to teach practitioners how to use the organic acids profile in their clinical practice. We're going to do a deep dive today on what this profile is, what it can tell practitioners about their patient's health that they're not getting from other labs, and why everybody should be educated on this. But before we get started, I want to hear a little bit more about the two of you. How did you end up teaching about this profile and the many other tests available through Diagnostic Solutions? Thanks, Kate, for having us. I started out in drug discovery, actually medicinal plant dis uh, discovery. I was really interested in medicinal plants, and that's what I studied in school and ethnopharmacology, actually. But it wasn't too long after I got my master's in pharmacy and biomedical science, was hired by Metametrics Clinical Laboratory. That was almost 18 years ago. They were purchased by Genova Diagnostics. So I, I, you know, and then later on, I started my own business and then also do consulting for diagnostic solutions. So I've been in the, the diagnostic, the really in the lab testing industry for quite a while, for about 18 years, helping clinicians understand what these uh, lab results mean. It's been a wonderful ride. I did take a little foray into writing. So I wrote a book called Heal Your Oral Microbiome. I'm excited about it. But organic acids, I had the pleasure of working with uh, some of the pioneers in developing the organic acids test. And so it was really exciting when Diagnostic Solutions brought it out in 2021, I think it was, to have a metabolomics test and they've expanded their profiles there. So in terms of what excites me about this, I love this field of medicine that we are in. I love nutritional medicine. I love looking at the root causes of disease and not just the symptoms. And so that's really the power of this tool. And uh, Kat and I are excited to uh, teach the group of bootcamp uh, about it. So. Yeah. And I'll piggyback on that. So it's kind of funny, you know, I feel like birds of a feather flock together. Kath and I didn't know each other before DSL, but I feel like we kind of have similar backgrounds and I don't know, personality types. So it's interesting. So I'm a, I'm a clinical dietitian by trade. I actually have my master's essentially in metabolic physiology. My first love was more like sport performance nutrition. So I have an integrated master's from Colorado State in like a combined exercise physiology metabolism degree. It was like a unique program at the time when I went through it. So I've been a biochem nerd for a really long time. And then I fell into lab. I tell people that I got lucky because um, I do feel that way. But I, my first job was it with a cardiovascular laboratory, um, preventative cardiovascular lab. We did, we were blood um, and we did advanced biomarkers, lipidology. This, the, sci the, the reality is, is the science has been around for a very long time, but it's almost getting like this rebrand as we developed this field of metabolomics. And so I've worked for a few different labs in the last, gosh, uh, 15 years now going on. And it's been fun. I will say that I'd never really appreciated organic acids until coming to this team and honestly learning from Cass and some of the PhDs that are on our team that helped develop um, this tool. I feel like I feel like it gets overcomplicated and you lose sight of the actionability and the clinical utility because you get too in the biochemical weeds. And this is coming from someone who likes biochem, <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, you don't need to be an expert in the pathways. You just need to understand the patterns of the test and any good clinical tool is all about the patterns that you can pull out of it since being with this company. And that's why, yeah, we, you know, I think Cass and I make a pretty good team in terms of what we can, what we can put out there in, in, in education for the organic acids. And I think why now too, is the company did put a lot of effort into revamping the test over the past year, just working on some of the algorithmic reporting of it and the look in the feel and the intuitiveness of the test. So we've improved on that. So um, that's been fun. And I think it's, you know, we're here to showcase what we think is a really, a really nice clinical tool. Yeah, it is. I mean, all you have to do is look at kind of all of the information that you're going to get from this test. And the brilliant part is the ease of collection. I think a lot of clinicians feel like it's really hard to get their clients to go get a blood draw that would tell them everything that's going to be reported here. 
it, it seems like it's easy to collect and easy to read. And you guys, like you said, have revamped the test a bit so that you're interpreting it as you're looking at it. It's, it's, it's a lot more obvious what's going on. So let's start with the simple thing. So this is a urine organic acids profile, meaning let's talk about how it's collected. And then let's talk about what organic acids are. And then we'll go into why we should measure them and what we can find from it. So, you know, start with what is this test? It's a first morning urine collection. So it doesn't get any easier than that. You wake up in the morning and you pee in a cup. The kit gets collected, shipped to the patient's house and they can collect in the privacy of their home and they send it back. It's it's very clean, it's very simple. And I mean, as far as what we're looking at, we're looking at metabolites and I'll let Cass speak to that because I think she's a little more fluent. Sure, yeah. The organic acids are really just metabolic byproducts, you know, pathways in metabolism. And we are very interested in these organic acids, mostly because when an organic acid you know, spills in urine, when it goes high in urine, it clues us off that there is a, a metabolic pro like an issue with that enzyme, usually a, a cofactor, co it may need nutritional support. There's a few markers that are exceptions to the rule, like neurotransmitters or cortisol, for example, but most of them are metabolic byproducts that notify us that there is a nutrient need when that metabolic pathway is blocked. So that's the premise of the, of the test. And, you know, it's been, it started out as being used as a standard test and still is today for inborn errors of metabolism, you know, genetic diseases that affect metabolism and can be remedied through nutritional or lifestyle interventions. So um, that's, that's where it all started. And then it, it was, it has been used in integrative and functional medicine to help tell us about, you know, everyone else, not just people with genetic diseases. So there's a section of the test that we could appropriately label being about metabolism and energy production. Talk about that part of the test and what's included in that. So yeah, it's a mitochondrial, the mitochondrial health section. So we basically take you through mitochondrial pathways, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, fatty acid oxidation. So you're looking at how you're metabolizing your macronutrients. And if you're not metabolizing those correctly, you're going to have problems. So, I mean, it's it's really that straightforward at the end of the day. Um, it's just a matter of, of reading the labs and applying it. So, May, so it's all about that cellular energy production and through, through those mitochondrial pathways that we, that we understand them. And I think it's nice for clinicians to kind of think about the the types of patients that might you, we might see abnormals in this section with. I'd love to look at cardiovascular disease um, th through the lens of these markers, right? Because the heart is so rich in mitochondria. Well, fatigue is the big one, right? Fatigue's even like outside of our really clinical cases, clinical applications, sport performance is a big deal. So when folks look at this section, they're going to see things like lactic acid, succinic acid, malic acid. What is really being reported in this section. And let's help kind of paint a visual for folks. Like how does this fit into our biochemistry? Are we measuring the Krebs cycle? We are measuring the Krebs cycle. <laughs> Glycolysis feeding into the Krebs cycle. So you're looking at your sugar metabolism. Um, and I think that's what actually, I think that's a great strength of our test is that we have designed this test by pathways. And that's not the case of every organic acid report out there. So the intention was to essentially map your metabolomic pathways so you can see it follows sequence and then you can readily see where there could be a, a block in that pathway. What's an example of a pattern that might show up here that may lead a clinician to discover something about their client that's contributing to fatigue that they may not have known before? I guess I would say toxicity. That's one. I mean, when we're, when we're in this section with mitochondria, we're, we're really just kind of nuts and bolts looking at energy, cellular energy production. So those nutrients like CoQ10 and B vitamins and lipoic acid, and you can get some information about how do I kind of support the Krebs cycle and promote, you know, carnitine and riboflavin for helping make energy from fat. Those nutrients can help, of course. But in terms of the surprises, toxins can interfere with these enzymes on it. Heavy metals, for example, can interfere with mitochondrial function. And then it can be that people truly have genetic SNPs in these enzymes. So I don't can think of those as for first on the pick list, you know, first would be those nutrient associations. And then if you retest them, 
And those, those abnormalities are not going away. Even after you've provided all the proper nutrients, then you start to wonder, okay, is the enzyme damaged? Is there some, you know, so you can kind of look and think, be thinking about toxicity or genetic SNPs or other things in these pathways that might be underlying. Love it. I think that's beautiful and a really awesome way to get a very high level snapshot about the likely status of many different nutrients that, that play a role in creating energy in the body, but then also some blocks. You also have another section that really is focused on toxins, detoxification. What sorts of biomarkers are we seeing there? What are we measuring with this test? Well, we have a nice panel that looks at glutathione, which I'm sure is you know near and dear to all of our hearts, but we have a section that looks at glutathione, endogenous production, and then utilization and needs. Glutathione is a big deal in our society and a lot of disease states as well. We do look at some environmental toxicants. So Cass can speak to that. Sure. So toxins, we have a lot of different markers, but we look for a few different categories of toxins. We look at xylene exposure, which can come from like gasoline, paint, new carpet, things like that. We have markers that help us zone in on like styrofoam exposure, um, there's a marker called glucaric acid, which helps tell you about phase one uh, and in phase two detoxification, glucuronidation. Like Kat said, we've got three great glutathione markers, and we also lo- have a marker of oxidative stress. We have a gut dysbiosis section that I'm sure we'll talk about here in a minute. But within that section, we look at the conversion of benzoic acid to hippuric acid. Hippuric acid is on that list for me. So having high high levels is associated with Good health. It's also a marker of glycine conjugation, which kind of goes back to toxicity. So we, it, through that marker, we have information about how well glycine conjugation is happening, which is a phase two detox step. Amazing. This is what you're going to get in the boot camp, guys, is like going through each biomarker and understanding what is it? Why do we measure it? What are the studies that support its clinical utility? And how would you describe what you're seeing to a client? And then what would you do next? Which is kind of everything you need to know when you're looking at this stuff, because some of these words are going to be unfamiliar, actually. Even to functional medicine clinicians, if they're not used to screening for all these different metabolites, I think it's incredibly valuable for the client who comes in and says, I want to know about my toxic burden. I mean, think about trying to assess that with blood. And what is my body doing with that toxic burden? So it's not just, okay, you're peeing out a bunch of toxins, which... I'm sure we all are to a certain extent, right? Live in a fairly toxic world right now, but what is my bo- what is my body's capability of handling the toxic burden? What is my detoxification potential? How well are my cells functioning? I mean, that's what this lab is telling us more than just oh, we've been exposed. Yeah, and you mentioned that there's metabolites in here that will actually tell us about even gut health a bit. I think most people wouldn't think that with a urine test, you could pick up gut health issues. What are we seeing in this test that could actually point to that? Yeah. So, so the test measures in addition to all the other categories, right? Where energy production and stress and mood and neurotransmitters and toxins. And we also look at microbial metabolites. So that is really, I think, you know, we're all used to stool testing. Of course, we're big fans of stool testing over here. So you can, in a, with a stool test, you're looking at the specific microbes. In organic acids, you're looking at their byproducts, which, you know, these microbes make these waste products and then it gets into systemic circulation and we pee them out essentially. So this is more like a crude measure, but there's a lot of them and there's there's plenty of literature showing that these will go high when, you know, these are microbial metabolites. I mean, there's a lot of good literature out there and they're, and they're used to also these microbes eat what we eat, right? They eat polyphenols, they eat amino acids, they fungus, you know, eats more like sugars and things like that. So it's kind of an equation. The microbes have to be there and the dietary components have to be there And then you will get the um, microbial metabolites as evidence that microbes are kind of living and thriving. And so it's a, but it is a crude measure because we don't know exactly which bugs are involved, but it's been used for, you know, 30 plus years in our industry to get a sense of what's going on with, is there dysbiosis essentially? Is there overgrowth? Is there a problem with the microbiome? 
through this lens of the organic acids. And so, like I said, it's a crude measure. So really, I feel like we're really just kind of looking for, is there overgrowth or not? And we have, I mean, a number of markers, maybe 10, 15 different ones going back to bacteria, di different bacteria and fungus. You know, put that together with your patient's symptoms. Are they having symptoms that sound like dysbiosis? Are you seeing microbial overgrowth on the test? Okay, if so, then you may want to treat that. It might be as simple as cleaning up the diet and digestive enzymes and probiotics, or it could be more aggressive if you think you're dealing with, um, you know, a dysbiosis that you really want to get in there and do more like a five five R protocol. And then, of course, doing GI map testing to look more specifically and see the specific bugs is, is recommended if, if that seems right for, for the patient. When I talk about the organic acids test and who to recommend it for, it's those patients that have a systemic issue, whether cardiovascular or brain, et cetera, and that where there's a gut component as well. You know, when you have that combo, then it makes the organic acids a really great test for them. Yeah, it's a broad sweep. And I think you can get general insights of, you know, are, do we have a lot of gut dysbiosis, a lot of overgrowth? Usually that's going to point to poor digestion. You can get insights into what is your gut, how is your gut fermenting, whether it be more plant fermentation or protein fermentation. And we know that protein fermentation then therefore often leads to inflammatory byproducts. And a lot of people like organic acids for yeast, kind of like a yeast screen, even more so than a stool test, because a stool test is going to look at GI colonized yeast. So if there's more of a systemic issue, an organic acid test can complement that and really pick up on some of that like miss systemic yeast. So there's a lot of providers out there that will rely more heavily on an organic acid test than a stool test for, for yeast overgrowth. What types of metabolites or biomarkers would you see elevated or out of range if something is going on with yeast? Well, arabinitol is the big one, right? Arabinitol, it's a marker that, you know, I, I have read those papers. They're very convincing. It has been used as a me metabolic product of candida, a me metabolic test. And it's been used in hospital settings where invasive candidiasis was killing people, you know, and they're using this to, and, and, it, and it would track, you know, it would track the, the other tests that were measuring candida in these patients. So um, that's the best and strongest one. And I do think ar arabinitol is superior to some other similar sounding markers that are out there used by other laboratories. But we do have other markers of fungal um, metabolism available to clinicians. I mean, I think arabinitol is the one that we all stand behind the most in terms of actual literature to back it up, that it's related to fungus. But there's citromalic acid, there's tricarbolylic acid and tartaric acid. These are, you know, these can be related to fungus. They can also be related to dietary uh, intake and um, even bacteria can make these compounds. So that's why these microbial metabolites, it's a little fuzzy, but it still gives you uh, um, some very good information about what's going on. I think it's a useful additional piece of the piece of the puzzle. Yeah, we get asked a lot, which is the better test? Which one should I do? What would you prefer? And I mean, obviously, you're talking to to lab junkies, but like, we don't have I mean, the long and the short is we don't have an answer for that. I mean, I think you're, you're pr probably best to run both in the majority of scenarios. I think if you have someone with raging heartburn and GERD and ulcerative colitis, I mean, obviously you're going to want to look at a stool test first in that scenario. But to Cass's point, if you have more of these systemic sort of mitochondrial pieces, brain pieces, that's when the, that's when the organic acid comes in. But Otherwise, you know, there isn't really a good, you know, certainly one isn't better. It's more about the application of it and the patient profiling. And to the point, you know, the collection method, right? 